everybody. Oh, good call. I would have forgotten <laughs> to tell you to record. Oh, yeah. It happened. It happened in the past. So. Yep. So as, as we're having people filter in today, um, so the topic today is going to be about data modeling. And this is one that comes up over and over. And everyone keeps making the same question of, do we just have a way that we can do data modeling? Do we have a single thing that we can just do and it just works for data mesh? So, um, you know, JGP, I'm excited to get kind of your perspective on what you did specifically working with people uh, at PayPal and what you've been doing with working with, with um, consulting clients and things like that. But I, I, I think the, the big question becomes, do we already have the answer to how to do data modeling or <laughs> do we not at all and we need to invent a new way of data modeling or something like that somewhere in between? Can we get to value with what we've got before we figure out completely new ways? So lots, lots within that, but I, I'd love to hear kind of what you were doing when you were working with this and then we can kind of move from there. Yeah, so... I I I I would I would go with your second thing like uh, when you said hey we don't know yet how to do it okay so hey Julia um, I I don't think we we already know our the you know the the return of experience to do it to to define best practices around data modeling for data mesh um, so the way I was thinking and the way we implemented and we thought about that is because you are thinking as a product okay and because a product is supposed to be evolving over time uh, then your data modeling is as good as it as the first version is going to be okay and don't overthink it too much so so that's my theory and practice around it saying that okay it might not be the best and we don't want the best or we don't want to be perfect but we just want to have something that works for that okay and i think if you remember scott when we were talking about being a little bit more use case aligned that domain aligned that fits the purpose pretty well <laughs> yeah well and i think so you, you said a couple of things in there that that from the people I've talked to that are really important, right? Um, one like is like that I, it, like, I, like I'm not. So. <laughs> no, I'm saying that you said some things that are important that a lot of people have said. <laughs> um, but setting yourself up to evolve, right? Like the whole yeah. point of historical of data modeling has been threading as many needles as you can but then things are locked and, and become overly rigid. Um, but at the same point, like you said, does this encapsulate the information that we're trying to encapsulate? Great. Does it do it perfectly? No. But like, how do you think about, you know, how do you think about tying this into not creating data silos too, when you think about interoperability? When I think about interoperability, you know, people just say, oh, you just have linking keys and that's fine, right? Like we have, uh, the, you know, this universal ID and therefore these things are interoperable or we have this uh, date time stamp format and therefore everything is interoperable because we use UTC or whatever. And it, it, I'm just not seeing that when I'm talking to people. So let's talk a little bit at the data product level and then we can talk about at the greater mesh level because you do have to think about how you how your modeling interoperates with the existing data products. But like when you're going in to somebody, especially that's new with data modeling, how did you think about having that conversation? Is there anyone new with data modeling? Or I mean data modeling? I mean, I would be. <laughs> I, but you know okay. what I mean? <laughs> Yeah, no, no, no. I, I, I think, I think, I think I'm getting where, 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 where you are. So, uh, 
a lot of a lot of things and and please guys if you had a different experience chime in okay there's a lot of things i've seen is that in i would say traditional data engineering there's not a lot of modeling there's a lot of modeling oh we lost scott again um there's a lot of um, modeling when you're designing an application okay and i remember my college years where you go through the third normal form and blah 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 and trying to optimize the space in your in your relational database but when it goes to after that with the analytics um uh and, and to uh um and, and to and to data mesh in a way um to the use case, I didn't see a lot of modeling. Okay, I I see a lot of field to field mapping, or I see a lot of okay, I'm going to flatten this thing and keep the names, but not really restructure a lot. That that's what I've seen. I don't know if anyone has has, has seen something similar, Andrea. Huh? Uh, <clears throat> yes, in uh, in a data mesh that is a distributed approach to data management, this is true at the physical level when uh, at when you are working only within the domain, because uh, the same domain speak the same ubiquitous language. So what you need to make the product interoperable is just to have uh, the field that uh, you can use to join the data set between uh, two data product, the, the two data product speak the same semantics. And so there is not problem as soon as you are able to join them to make them interoperable. But uh, when you became more mature in your adoption of data mesh, you want also to uh, develop a data product that join the data across different domains. And uh, here modeling, at least the conceptual modeling, became something important because uh, you not only have to join the two data set from a, a technical point of view, a syntactic point of view, but you have also to join and make them interoperable at the semantic level. So. The, the, the field address of the data product um, customer in the marketing domain and the field address of uh, a customer data product uh, in the sales domains means the same thing or not. And so you have also to guarantee interoperability across different domain to have some sort of conceptual modeling that specify the meaning of the different uh, fields, term, data set in different domain that you do an, a unification. Otherwise, uh, this uh, semantic normalization is uh, uh, on the back of the consumer. And uh, we do not want to do that. We want that the, the, the mesh, the platform, the policy of the, 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 the governance team guarantee the interoperability as at the semantic way, at the semantic level, at least in my opinion. I, I, I like where you're going, Andre, but is that part of modeling or is that more part of governance or as intersection? Or, or yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's a, of course, there are different levels of modeling. No? You have physical modeling, logical modeling, conceptual, uh, conceptual modeling. I'm talking about conceptual modeling, and I agree with you. Conceptual modeling is more uh, related to governance. In fact, in, 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 in my idea, the conceptual modeling should be centralized, federated at least, not yeah. pushed yeah. on on the single data product team. And one thing that you said in there, Andrea, was it, it was interesting. I had a recent conversation with Jimmy Coslow at, at uh, Northern Trust, and he was talking about interoperability between data sets within a single data product versus the, the greater mesh. And kind of what you were talking about was is it interoperable or interconnectable or interworkable or whatever? Like you can combine data, but does it mean anything? And within the data product, it can get more and more complex to have things interoperable. The more data sets you have within that one data product, but then you have to think about, you know, does every single aspect of every data set have to be interoperable with every aspect of every data set of other data products? No, but you do need those, that thing at the mesh level is that to, to make that interoperation easier between multiple data products, because otherwise you just have high quality data silos. Mm -hmm. Correct. So how do you, how do you think, and, and I'm not just asking only you, but I'm asking everybody out there, but how do you think about helping people to thread that needle of, hey, 
you're you're coming in and we need you to be interoperable with XYZ data product. Does that happen at the start? Or does that happen when someone goes, we want to combine these two data sets and somebody goes, well, those aren't really interoperable right now. Or like, how do you think about doing that so that you don't say everything must interoperate with everything else? Because then you just have an actually tightly coupled but loosely managed uh, mm -hmm. enterprise data warehouse. <laughs> so it's got all the rigidity problems, but it has all even more of the um, decentralized problems rather than the loosely coupled. So, uh, you know, it's it's like, how do you think about as things start to scale, how do you talk about that versus at the, the mesh level versus the data product level? Sorry, mm -hmm. long, long question, but this no, has been something clear. that's been so <laughs> frustrating for me because I can't get a good answer. It's clear. From, from, from In my opinion, uh, the, the answer is a federating operating model applied also to, to modeling. So basically, having a federated team that create the conceptual model with the very core and important uh, concept for the business model. And then uh, the data product, uh, the data product team, when deploy a new data product to make it semantically interoperable with other data product across domain, have to specify how the data exposed the link to the central uh, conceptual model. So can, it's not something that is imposed, but there should be incentive to make this happen more and more. The data product team can specify, okay, on this output port, I exposing this data set that have this physical schema, but pay attention, this table is linked to the concept of customer in the central model, and these three to field mean first name, last name, as described in the central model. So the, 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 the data product team is uh, absolutely free to decide the physical schema of the data that is related to the use cases that uh, is trying to support. But if you want to be interoperable with other product across the domain, they have to specify this semantic linking. So specify the table to which concept is associated and within the table, the field, the important field to which term are associated in the central model. And the central model is made by a federated team that does central modeling. Conceptual models. And That's my view right now. Yeah. Well, and I like that that there's a central model that not everything has to fit, or maybe you have multiple central models. Right? Uh, even, multiple, even multiple is possible. And in general, my idea is to have not the, the full model of the company, but uh, implement the central model with an approach that is driven by the use cases. When you need, for example, to model uh, information about the customer because you have use cases that need to cross-join the data uh, from different domain about the customer, you create the concept in that moment. You do not do that upfront uh, in the central modeling team, but when it is needed to model some specific concept at the level of detail that is needed to support that specific use case that you are going to implement. Yeah, and, and th this, this idea of because we're doing decentralized or federated data management, that there is nothing centrally created or centrally managed like that model. Just it it doesn't fit the more people I talk to. So it's it's good to hear that I'm not crazy. Uh, I want to open it up to well, everybody as as per always. Hey, okay, on this one specific thing. Yes, yes, JGP. Yes, waka waka waka. Um, uh, does anybody else have any comments they want to have before we have to go back to JGP? We don't have to go back to me, but yeah, comments <laughs> are welcome. <laughs> Hi, all. I just want to like uh, put my two cents. Um, well, we shouldn't be hard on teams that even map, you know, and do simple joins from table to table because it's a steal a maturity level, which depends on company to company. Like we can all imply that everyone is unicorn cats and can do, you know, whatever data modeling. But in reality, it's not. It's just top performing teams who are motivated, you know, to be a fantastic data engineers or <laughs> politics engineers. In reality, if like I, I, what I see, I mean, to my limited sample, 50%, maybe 60% of teams will do some SQL joins, whatever, which is good enough, already good enough. And they start to think about DBT. They've been introduced to data form, which is like, we shouldn't be hard on them. 
because the market is still developing. This is, I mean, this is my perspective. It would make sense. So do you have an idea on how you talked a little, like the word incented has come up multiple times. Does anybody have ideas on how to incent people to make better data models or to measure how good the data model is? Because, you know, JGP talked about, we want to go towards good enough. How do we tell us something is good enough when it comes to a data model? If they talk to business users and business users see the value of the data model outcome, it's literally a first step. And it doesn't necessarily matter how much it costs, but what, what efforts were put in it just to give motivation for these analytics engineers or data engineers to start playing with it and do more sophisticated things. I would I would start from there basically to give them this sense that their work matters. Just even just NPS is basic like I know that's a very product manager thing of just like I hate NPS. Are, are, to be are, are people satisfied? But you know what I mean? Like, are people satisfied? Because people want, uh, data people want a data answer. Of, I want to be able to test and measure if this is good enough. Unfortunately, you cannot measure, like it's hard to measure what is the return on investment from data mesh because it's very much a joinery. Like it's not a, you know, a time frame <clears throat> project, right? So that's why what I'm trying to say as the market is still developing, uh, I mean, we can bear with the sense that this model actually was good enough to provide well. I mean, I would, I would, I would start from there, and it's very much limited to the sample of the market I'm working with. So yeah, this is my two cents. I kind of liked where uh, Andrea was going or was going before. Um, I like, I like the concept of a common language or a common set of primitives. So I may not centralize the modeling, let the model happen in the domain that it needs to happen, but provide the tools that allow for the interoperability. So even just the discussion of an address, right? If I can classify what an address is, like the whole the whole point of the mesh is to make the production of data products easier, right? If I can grab components and say, Boop, I can pop one of those into my model and it's got baked data quality rules built into it or hooks built into it that allow me to standardize. Um, there's some leverage that you can take advantage of there by having a common language. So if I want to drop, like I'll, I'll, I'll take something simple. I want to drop a date of birth into a data element. There's a classification. Yes, it's a date, but there may be some built in quality logic if I brought a date of death and a date of birth together um, that I can get across the enterprise. Um, addresses are very similar uh, in that respect, but you know the need is different. I might have different classifications of addresses. Like I might have a fully qualified address that's fully geocoded. It should look the same regardless of where I'm consuming it in theory. So I, I, I kind of like the idea of common, you know, you know, a common set of primitives that I can bring onto my palette when I'm modeling. Yeah, one one of so, the things that comes up a lot. No, sorry, JTP, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna shut up here in a second. But one thing that comes up a lot is how much can we provide easy paths to data product producers? Right. It's funny how much people that look at data mesh at the start think it's all about um, data consumers, but so much of this is making this easy path to make it easy and scalable and kind of repeatable and in that repeatable, that interoperable for the producers. And so that's, you know, providing them blueprints, that's providing them all these, these paths to simply do a lot of what you're saying, where we go, hey, if you wanna do a date format that is not this date format, okay, but your your data product is immediately going to end up being downgraded in quality simply because it's not interoperable, you know, and, and that, that you all, you provide those those easy paths. And if somebody wants to go outside of them, okay, you don't really 
force them because then you'll get bad quality anyway. But exactly what you're talking it's about. It's just a it's just a further classification, right? So yes, I can do a straight up date. That primitive exists. I should be able to do that for any date whatsoever. But if I'm going to include something and I'm going to classify it as a date of birth, do I generally want to treat my dates of birth similarly? Right. It's just a further classification of a date and it may have more meaning to it than just a straight up date. But I'm, I'm curious what other people's thoughts are or their experiences have been. So I, I just have a, a, a follow up question on on, on, on sure. what you just said, Dan. I, I, so so your idea, if I understood correctly, is about this very common primitives, but prim primitives at the kind of the almost the atomic level, like a date, uh, an address is a little bit more like an object, but it's still very. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, sorry. Go ahead. Continue. No. So 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 so. So I, I I like I like I like where you're going. Like okay, I I can see the thing. Okay, I'm going to drag and drop and and things and okay. And in my ETL, blah blah blah, I'm going to transform this rough address that looks like nothing into this common normalized address. Right. Uh, um, is that is that the responsibility of so, so I used to be an enterprise architect. Like I, I know I'm going yeah, yeah. in different directions, but yeah, I used no, to be no. an enterprise architect. And, and the thing is, this this role does not often exist in data. Okay, uh, um, enterprise data architect. I've not seen that many. Um, is that something that a policy, or it's maybe that's data governance, or, or that should actually say that saying like, hey, um, this is how we structure an address, okay? And this is valid for the entire world, and um, and this is a this is our format for a date. So I think I think we're getting back to a little bit governance there um, or yeah. architecture. Yeah, no, I, I, would, I don't have a problem with it. I'm just no, trying no, no. To... I would tend to agree with you. It's almost like uh, I, I would look at it as uh, analogous to some of the policy as code, right? So you're defining things at the mesh level that can be implemented consistently um, ac across the enterprise. Like I, I, I can tell you from having modeled subjects, various subjects in the past, that it is an absolute pain when you're modeling to, you know, create a, you know, a street. Like all the components of an address manually, one at a time, is just a waste of time. You're doing the same task repeatedly over and over and over and over again. And then you then you're fraught with uh you know inconsistency. Uh this one forgot a data element, this one named a data element differently, and you're getting into that whole semantic governance issue again of you know what is it, right? Th there are some things that are just very clear on what they are, like if like a, a yeah. social security number in the United States, right? It may be represented as a string, but there's a whole lot more validation to a social security number, standard validation, than there is in just a straight up string, right? And if I could just drag those components and say, I want a social to pop in here, right? With with, with the associated governance to a social. Yes, right? yes, yes, yes. It has, I don't have to enforce them, but I can. And I don't have to write them because they exist. Right. So I get the consistency in my potentially in my data quality across the enterprise uh, by creating it more at the like, like you said, a little bit more at the object level. Like I, I probably was a little primitive in my use of primitives. <laughs> like there's primitives and, the, and extensions or objects or classifications, like yeah. things that I want to drag as predefined into my model. It's, it's very much like object-oriented programming right the thing is, yeah absolutely uh, so yes. you you say okay this is a date it behaves this way it has to it has to be measured and qualified in this ways and, and things like that yep. i like that i like that and even lot. like it, we we did things where we had common sets of identifiers like just a list of identifiers that hung off of a subject that you know yeah. they were basically name value pairs your type your value you might have a little bit more metadata 
uh, associated with them, but mm -hmm. you could consistently drag that and add it onto an object. Um, and it behaved consistently. I'm, I'm just, you know, just, just on, on, on digging a little bit on, on your idea, Dan is, is I wonder if, if this is not something we or someone should come up as an industry standard, you know, like, like something like defining a, we all, okay. For all in the U S we all know what a social security number looks like and the value and the rules around it. Uh, it's a bit different in other countries, but, but, uh, but, but a, a, an address or is, is also a good example, but it's true that every time you start a project, you've got a team redesigning for the nth time, what yes. is an address. Okay. So right. I think it's, and, and the thing, the thing that's interesting there too, is like, from an input standpoint, I might be able to ingest a dirty address. And I may have at the, you know, at the mesh level, I can enforce the quality of an address. Like if I want to convert that and standardize it and geocode it for analytical purposes, that can actually happen behind the scenes. Um, what gets interesting is when you consider shifting some of that stuff even further left, right? Like how many times do I do want to do a social security number validation in n number of input systems, right? Theoretically, if I can enforce that from a standard service, all the better, but I have to be able to classify that data element as a social security number to invoke that. And, 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 and to keep in mind that you don't want to do it like 20 times because Correct. you've got 20 pipelines Correct. assuming your social security numbers. You want right. to do it once. Or... Right. But even if you push it back into the source systems, each one of them has to code it separately, right? So you don't know the level of consistency that's going to happen in those source systems and pushing it even outside uh, the ingestion process. So yeah, like in, in the ingestion process, if you're able to classify it as a social, great. Yeah, you can absolutely implement a standard. But if you do want to push some of that quality further left into the source systems themselves, if you have control of them, you still want that to be consistent across your enterprise. Or, I mean, or, or, aren't there or, ISO or, standards? Aren't, don't these things exist already though? Like, do we need to create a new, it, it kind of reminds me of that XKCD of, there are 13 competing standards. This is crazy. You know, two months later, there are four, you know, I'm going to create one standard that that combines them all. And then two months later, there are 14 competing standards. Oh, I can, so, I can tell you, we ran into that problem in healthcare, right? There's oh a yeah. number of diagnosis <laughs> codes that all have to be standardized across the board. And even if you t t just take something as simple as a gender code, right? You, it's, you it's, can not have, simple, it's not simple it's, anymore it's, right <laughs> like you have you have all sorts of different ways that an enumerated list may be reflected in a source system right it, and it's and it works for that source system like if the source system is numeric based in its ids you're going to get a one two and three for you know male female unknown as an example just as a simple case um, it can get more complicated than that, but you may have another system that's MF and you, another system that's male, female, unknown, and you've got to bring those things together, but you need to understand that what's being communicated is a gender code, right? So that you understand what to standardize to. And and Dan, uh, Stefan speaking, if yeah. you were to validate an address, yeah, th does it mean that you will create a new uh, dimension that is called validated address. You could, yeah. Uh, like when when we brought stuff together, we we we, uh, we were we were a little bit more like a a medallion architecture, if you think of it that way, where you had the raw, the the cleansed, and then the optimized uh, for analytics, right? So in that, so we were holding on to the raw, but we did maintain a separate silver, if you think of it that way, um, that, um, you know, we did physically change the address. We standardized it. So we had what came in the door. We had what we standardized it to, but then we geocoded it so that it was also available for, you know, geospatial analytics down the line. 
that was that didn't exist in the source system. It was something that we enriched along the way. If you if you can do it, if you can do it, yes, yeah. correct. But, but if you can't do it, you 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 can also think about a source aligned data product, right? That is kind of the the data product which is going to be the closest possible to the source. Yeah, exactly. And and, and then your 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 modeling could be a mimic of the source the source modeling plus this extra fields or dimensions as you said Stefan about a, a validated address or a, a properly format uh, date of birth or a validated social security number and things like that so, so but, yeah, but it, it, I mean, in I mean, mesh terms it might be an aggregated right I mean Where I'm pulling it from different sources but I'm aggregating it into a common I mean my question is how do you differentiate uh, a mistaken address versus uh, like an address that was entered like not by mistake but wrong like someone is entering a fake address uh, that looks like an address but either doesn't exist you know so you cannot geotag it so when yeah when when you we used to um, interact with locate and their APIs had different levels of um, understanding on whether you actually had a hit or not uh, and the granularity that you hit on. So like a mailing address is entirely different from a physical address, right? Um, and then the granularity of your physical address inside of a building. So like I could, I could be sitting at, you know, 123 Main Street in an office building of 50 stories, right? we're all at that same place, but where I physically reside inside that building um, requires a different level of granularity depending on the use case that I'm going after, right? So like, if I'm looking at a mailing address, I, I wanna know what floor you're on. I wanna know what suite you're in, right? Down to that level of detail. And I probably don't care as much about geocoding that address, probably a little less so. Right. If I'm looking at it from a risk standpoint, I want to know specifically inside that building where you slipped, tripped and fell. What floor were you on to the level of granularity that I can go to with an address standardization? And it gets more complicated when you start to triangulate spaces out in the world. So like I was 100 yards from the intersection of X and Y. Right. There may be a lat long that's associated with that, but getting to that point um, may require a little bit of, of, of work, depending on the use case you're going after. But in the simple cases, like relatively simple cases of like residences, for the sake of argument, if somebody gives you a bogus address, it's not going to be able to cleanse it. And if it can't cleanse it, it can't geo, it, like if it can't find it, it can't geocode it. Right. The best it might do is come back and say, hey, the best I could do is put you in the town that you were in. But I didn't get a match. Right. So I, I think behind the scenes, you may want to evaluate some of those things in terms of what's acceptable for your use case. Right. Like some of that just may fall off as data quality issues. I yeah, you, can, you could grade it or something. Say, okay. Right. Correct. Um, yeah. And that, that depends on the use case. That's where I like I, I kind of like embedding some of that logic in in a more common manner than having people need to reinvent it every place they go. Because th there are common building blocks, like even even the 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 treatment of enumerated lists is fairly common across an enterprise, right? Like you may want to create a hierarchy out of some of those things. You may want to map certain things. Um, it, it's it's fairly common. And if you have some of those building blocks, people aren't reinventing the wheel along the way. It, it, that's been my experience. I, I'm oh, it's a, it's curious a, how other people might have handled similar situations. This is, this is, this is a great feedback. So to come back on, on Scott's, your comment about ISO and things like that. Yeah, you've got, uh, and, and going back to Dan, you've got some some, some standard lists like countries, okay, or country code or whatever. Yeah. But you, you know that even the standard is not free. If you want to, if you want to access to buy, you've got to pay for the standard. So 
Yes, there's some kind of clones on Wikipedia and things like that, but the official standard, it's it's actually, and it's not cheap, It's uh, which which is a lot of stuff. Yeah, I, I, I can say in, in the healthcare space, we actually used a service uh, that, and, and it was part of the embedded cost of, of the application, but you, you had to purchase the codes for usage, 100%. That just feels wild because it's like, okay, isn't it just a standard? Can I just grab the standard? <laughs> like, I just, I, I get it. But at the same point, it just feels weird that I guess maybe we do need open source standards on this stuff that make this far some easier. People, because some it becomes a revenue working. source. Yeah, some people are actually working on open source standards. You would love for it to be open, yes, to really facilitate interoperability. But I, I think some organizations use it as a revenue stream to, you know, do the work that they do. Yeah, I mean, especially in finance, you know, the standardization of financial instruments, uh, that's a very costly uh, data set yep. uh, that you pay for. You have to license it, you know, whether it's the QC or, you know, and, and some are non-standard, like Bloomberg IDs. Mm -hmm. that uh, not only are not standards, but they will create their fake QC, for example, that people assume is a real one. So there's also like some, uh, uh, the notion of uh, ISO here is kind of blurry. <laughs> I think it's definitely a contributing factor, like you, you use them. Um, but it, it, there were definitely situations that we ran into where people used the standard and then expanded on it, like you were saying, Stefan. It, it's it they customized, <laughs> let's say, on top of the standards, and then you have to deal with it inside the enterprise. It's not as clean, I would say. <laughs> So we, we've talked about a whole lot of challenges and, and a couple of approaches, but like what what are we thinking if somebody is saying, how do I do data modeling? Do we just tell them do data vault 2.0? That seems to be the thing that most people say when we're saying like what what advice would people give to each other as to how to move forward? You know, JGP, you started kind of at the beginning of don't get too wrapped around the axle, just get something out, get it into people's hands. Yulia kind of said the same thing of get stuff into people's hands. You know, Andrea was talking about how we need to create easy paths for folks and that we need to create some standards. And, and uh, Dan, you were talking a lot about the, um, uh, we just need to have standard objects or standard ways of storing certain things so that it's very simple for people to mark that this is a more in-depth concept or this is the way that we do that but like <clears throat> is there a way that people can get started or is there are there some paths that you don't that you recommend people don't go down or how do people think about that i can i've been quiet i thought it's fantastic discussion i don't have i'm not an expert in this area but i'll give you a few things i think as as it a former enterprise architect, I tried to optimize for the global environment. Uh, and what ends up happening is you you um, may optimize for cost in the, in the long run, but you sacrifice agility in the near term. What I found is what most businesses try and do is, is given the choice, optimize for agility. So, so what does that practically mean? It means don't look for the global perfect data model. Um, think of the data model in the context of a data product and then if you do that well, that data model is rarely exposed in its native form um, anyway, because by definition, the data product is, is um, we have consumable APIs, pipelines, or otherwise uh, ports, input and output ports to actually get that data in a format that makes sense for that data product. So, so the long and short is, is, is get started and not, not worry as much about the global uh, maximum or the global optimized scenario, uh, because you'll be spending a lot of time getting there. So, I mean, that's my two cents worth. Yeah, I, I, I like that concept. And I think that that global concept can actually build over time through the agility 
uh, as you identify new use cases that can be utilized across the board. I think the the one thing that I do want to be cognizant of, though, is that if if I am consuming data sets from one domain and data sets from another, that there's a level of at least a level of consistency in terms of how I interact with that data. Just in terms of common types, like I, I, I don't want to be consuming apples and oranges and finding the commonality in, you know, fruit and seeds. <laughs> yeah, I think I agree. I think th there's a challenge, obviously, when you have organic growth. But what yeah. I would say is, is there's a great opportunity for the data product owners who are accountable for that, for harmonizing that as opposed to a, a third parties. Yep. Yeah. It's it's funny, Yulia, I want to call on you in a second, but I was at a conference recently and kind of what Eric was saying, have the conversation about optimizing for speed versus, you know, perfect and, and correctness and things like that. Because a lot of times people will take time to market and you, if we create iterative capability, you can get to more and more value and more and more correct over time, but you can get something that's good enough for now into somebody's hands quickly. So, Yulia. Yeah, I guess I <clears throat> failed to convey my I failed to convey my point, but I very much agree with Eric that you just need to let people to innovate first. And uh, then also, I guess why you so much, so I'm trying to find the right word. Yeah, no, just, just you, you can just put it out there. Like, you want to then. No, no, no. I just <laughs> feel like you have a lot of experience yep. and you went through this learning curve. That's yes. why you're trying to educate like folks, you shouldn't do the, those mistakes. But in fact, it's literally impossible for those data engineers within their businesses and industries not to make their specific um, mistakes on their learning path. And this is what I'm trying to say, that we shouldn't handcuff those data engineers if they have any motivation to do better data modeling and to satisfy their uh, business <clears throat> uh, business users. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I hope I didn't come across no, no, no. as if I was saying shackle them in any way, shape no. or form. Sure. I'm actually a big, I'm a big advocate of moving with agility. What I see is that core set of functionality actually building up over time. <laughs> As you're seeing patterns, you want to address yeah. those patterns and propagate those patterns uh, over time. But um, that and comes I, as an experience. Like you yeah, oh, absolutely. And I think like one, of, one of the things that does make it difficult, and I think we, it, we hit on it a little bit earlier, is that concept of... Um, query driven development where my model was an answer to several queries not really a model of the business and that, that's actually one of the things that i really like about the mesh is model your business you yep, can yeah. then leap off of that but make sure you've modeled your business i think that's a really good point and 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 i, I like both of what you're saying is like get too good enough get to have communicate uh -huh. communicate that this isn't Perfect. And if you communicate that, then it's fine to go out there and, and not go out with it. Um, Stefan? Yeah, I mean, to uh, you know, bounce on what you just said, Scott, uh, Scott and, and what Julia said, like, you know, having an iterative approach. But the question I have is, what is the, the cost of making a mistake, uh, you know, in, in, in the world of data mesh, in the sense that you've spoken to the business users and maybe you don't always have a second chance or a third chance. Like, what is the best approach here? Although you tell them in advance that in the approach might may be iterative. Like, how many chances do you have, really? Like, from from your experience, like, how do you approach that? Should 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 we answer or should we postpone that to another call <laughs> because we're really at time? Yeah, uh... it's a big it's a big question. That's true. <laughs> I don't, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know if, I don't know if there's really a, a, a an answer in the number of times, but uh, I think it's more like a version planning and things like that, and 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 it's always a balance of how much is a mistake is going to cost you versus how much is the time to market going to cost you when it comes to a data product. It's, it's, it's... I can tell you, we made a mistake 
once and we change the interface, which is effectively another product. As long as there's a migration path and you've better served the customer over time, I I think you can you can evolve and you have some leeway to evolve. Um, you know, we we had one thing that we split into three things, right? It's pretty major change, pretty major consideration, but if you allow people to land softly, uh, you deprecate the former and advocate the new with a migration path, then I I, I think there's a little bit more um, leeway there to be if, able to evolve with the business. If you don't have room to make mistakes, you can't do data mesh. It, you have to be but, designing for change, period. Yeah, and, and, and period. that you're learning more as you're going forward. So yes, you can. You don't want to make catastrophic mistakes, but it's 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 almost like bob ross said of happy little accident right <laughs> of hey we learned more about this we learned more about this and if somebody isn't willing to rely on something that that you're not 100 percent sure on then they can't do data and, and 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 i'm not trivializing making issues or or making mistakes but at the same point you have to have that communication with them and if they're not ready to have that iterative approach you can't do data mesh because you have to do a fail fast approach. I think what I mean is users thinking that you can do the changes in the back end without impacting them necessarily. Like where you know, they may not understand where you draw the line between what's gonna impact them and what's gonna impact maybe just the ETL or not, you know, because they may not be familiar with that part. Yeah, I I, I... We could go on and on. I, I, I like yep. Carlos Mateo said, your first three months, you can't lock to anything I do because I'm going to keep changing my data product. After that, it's a breaking change and I made a big mistake, right? Like I, I have made a, a problem for you. If I have made a big breaking change after that, I need to communicate the breaking change. And if I keep making breaking changes, I have lost your trust. But other than that, in the exactly. first three months, yeah. eh, you can't lock on to anything I do because I have to figure out what I'm doing. Okay, that, that, I like, make, that I like makes that sense. Model. Yeah. <laughs> that, that's that's actually a pretty good summary, Scott. I think I think we should we should all leave on that note. Uh, and uh, three months grace period, and then you're fired. Okay, guys. <laughs> <laughs> what, what's next week, JGP? What are we? Yeah, what next, are we next, next week? next week is zero trust architecture. Okay, and uh, so so this this is also going to be. Uh, a fun one. We need to invite some hackers and things like that. Okay. And people like that. So, so we, we can have a lot of fun. Okay, guys, see you next week. Appreciate and, you. Uh, thank, thank you. Everybody. Thank, thank you. Thank you everybody for coming. Thank you. Bye-bye.